Welcome to Research in Financial Markets. This is my second lecture and the paper that I would like to discuss with you today is entitled Replicating Anomalies. So what's going on here in this paper? So as the title already tells us, they replicate anomalies. Yeah? So they go through 452 different stock market anomalies um, implemented in the US stock universe and replicate them with different kinds of methods. So it's important or an important concept that they talk about in this paper is uh, scientific replication. So they, they argue, let me just take it away. So they argue that scientific replication of, of a certain outcome, of a certain study, needs a, or ha has at least three different requirements. Yeah? Scientific replication. So the first one, the first requirement is that we use a different sample, uh, a different sample than the original study. A different sample. The second requirement is that we would use a different population. Uh, different population and the third requirement is that we use a similar but not identical methodology. So a similar model but not identical. So the difference between a scientific replication and the statistical replication is that we use, uh, if we would run a statistical replication, what we would use is we would use the same model, we would use the same population, but a different sample. For instance, what we do in bootstrapping, when you apply bootstrapping to a data set, you create um, a new sample or an artificial sample based upon the same population. And what you get is basically different t-statistic, if you would do that for a, a vector of returns, for instance. So that's a scientific replication, and they argue that they apply the scientific replication to 452 different stock market anomalies. So if we consider, um, if you can now go back in our thoughts to the Pharma and French paper that we, that we discussed in the, in the last lecture, let me take this away now. So how do they construct, for instance, the value factor in that paper? Yeah. So let's see. So when we have this is the stock universe. Yeah. Let's call this a stock universe, including all NYSE stocks. Yeah. So NY. As e stocks, yeah, and here we have everywhere our stocks, okay? So they divide the whole stock universe first of all into two groups, the small and big stocks, yeah. So let's say here we have our small stocks. And here we have our big stocks. And then they divide it into th three more groups. Yeah? So we have stocks that have a high book to market ratio. We have medium. Medium, big book to market ratio. And we have stocks that have a low book to market ratio, okay? And here we have NYSE stocks. 
So what I do then is they for the, considering the small stock universe, yeah. So we have here groups that say here's group one, two, three, four, five, and six. And now we can uh, we we know if size is completely uncorrelated with book to market ratio, uh, with the second characteristic that we uh, sought. And if we, if we would assume that we would have in each group the same number of stocks, yeah, then we would basically have in each of these group one over six. One over six. So 16.6 seven percent of the stocks would be in each group right but they write in the paper if you read it carefully that they use inde independent sort yeah so independent sort means that they allocate a stock into the group let's say low and small stocks if they fulfill both criteria at the same time so that, that means, yeah, so you will not have 16.6% here in each of this group, but this will, this will vary. Yeah? So you have a different number of stocks in each of these groups. Okay? And why is that so? Well, because these two uh, characteristics, like market capitalization or size of the company and book to market ratio are correlated. Okay? So you will not have equal amount of stocks in each group, but this will vary, okay? But that's just something that you should have in your back mind. So how do they compound now the uh, return of the uh, value factor? So first of all, in each of these groups, they value, they evaluate the returns. Yeah? So if we have, let's say, the, the overall market cap in, in, in the NYSE universe, if it's, let's say, 1,000 and a stock has a market capitalization of, let's say, 2, then the weight would be 2 over 1,000, okay? So that means value weighting. Yeah? They do this for all stocks. So all stocks are value weighted in these groups. So then, you know, the value factor is obviously a trading strategy where you are long on firms that have a high book to market ratio and you finance this position by shorting stocks that have a low book to market ratio. So they implement this trading strategy for the small stock universe. So we are long, we buy group one and we sell group three. And again, the returns here in these groups are evaluated according to the market cap. So this is this one portfolio and we take it times 0 0.5 yeah? because we have we have already evaluated the returns in each of these groups. So we half of our risk factor return is we give it a, a, a weight of 0 0.5 for this first zero cost strategy. 0 times 5 times this trading strategy plus 0 0.5 times group 4 yeah, minus group 6. So and what comes out here is our evaluated uh, return of our trading strategy. And in this case, as an example, we have the book to market ratio. Yeah? Another thing that we should uh, bear in mind here is that uh, in order to uh, compound or in order to get the data for the book value or the market value of the firm, they have to go and they have to have a look at the balance and at the balance sheet of each company. So basically, what they do if we have a timeline here, uh, let's let's say this this is our timeline T, and 
the, the uh, firm year, it, it, if it ends in December, so the, the first allocation, according to the strategy, uh, would take place, let's say, in July. Yeah. In July. Why is that so? Well, because according to some accounting standards, so everything that has happened here in the previous year, uh, in the previous firm year, should be available within the first six, six months period of the current year. So if we are in June, in June, this is June, we have the information available of the, of the last, of, of the past year. So we, we grab the information in June, uh, corresponding to the last firm year, and knowing that, that we have the information available within this, this uh, six months period of the current year, we can condition or we can use this characteristic for our first sort in July. So the first, well, for, the, for the return in uh, July. So that's basically, we're using past information, yeah, that's basically old, yeah, obviously, for compounding the uh, value factor, and the same is true for the investment factor and for the profitability factor. Yeah. We always use old uh, information. As you will see, uh, this is different for the momentum factor, but we will talk about this uh, in some minutes. So the point is, first of all, um, how they construct the uh, factor in the uh, Farmer and French uh, paper in 2018. And now we can, of course, play around. So what would be a similar but not identical method? So if you would, for instance, if you would have here, uh, let's say, we have uh, five groups. Uh, then we would if we take this away. So in this case, let's say we have one, two, three, four, five, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So in this case, if you would now basically uh, construct our trading strategy as zero, zero point five times this group minus this group plus zero point five times this group minus this group. Okay. So this would be a, a similar but not identical method. Yeah? And in, in their paper, obviously, as you read it, you will see that they operate with 10 groups. Yeah? So they have basically, and they have a univariate sort. Yeah? So they don't do this double sorting. They, have a, they sort uh, univariate and they use these sides. So they use 10 groups. Yeah? 10 groups. Yeah? 1 to 10. And then if if we denote one as low, and the last group we have uh, the high characteristic, then they would implement their training strategy or their anomaly uh, as, as a strategy that is long on group 10 and short on group 1. Yeah? So they, have a, they increase basically um, the spread, the return spread, by using more groups. Okay? Let's take this away. So the question arises, why is it important to replicate anomalies? Yeah? So why is it important? Why important? And what's the problem actually? What's the problem? What's the problem? So first of all, the first problem is that uh, finance and economics as well, and also accounting, these are uh, is especially the empirical studies, they are observational in their nature. Okay? So finance as a discipline is observational
observational in its nature. So we actually we want to have a sample of, of, of stocks in a certain, let's say, geographic uh, area. If we have, for instance, if you figure out here, we have a certain anomaly in the US, it doesn't mean that the same anomaly uh, can be uh, figured out in other stock markets. Yeah? So we simply don't know that. Um, another issue is that we have a publication bias. Yeah? So the publication bias. What does that mean? So it means basically, and this is also what they write in the paper, that uh, editors from top journals, or from journals and finance in general, they tend to publish papers that have some result, some, let's say, positive result. Yeah? They, they find some certain, let's say, patterns in, in stock returns or commodity returns or any, any other asset returns. Yeah? So, they, because they are more likely to get citations and they are more likely to be read from, from other scholars. So, obviously, the editors from these journals, they would rather choose uh, a, a study uh, to publish in, in the journal that has some, some sort of result, okay? So